Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the first mover advantage that arises under Stackelberg competition. You will recall that the difference between Cournot and Stackelberg is the sequence of moves. Under Cournot, firms choose their quantities of production simultaneously. Under Stackelberg, the firms choose sequentially. A leading firm makes its quantity decision, and then a following firm observes that quantity and then chooses its own quantity. It is not immediately clear which of the firms benefits from this switch in timing. And in fact, I can make a plausible argument why the follower or the leader might have an advantage. From the follower's perspective, it is always seeing what the leading firm has done when it makes its decision. So no matter what that leading firm has chosen, the following firm is always able to choose the quantity of production that maximizes its payoff given that level of production from the leader. The leader might also have an advantage here though. It can credibly commit to a quantity of production. By going first, it can say, this is my quantity and I can't change it and now you have to make your choice based off of what I've done. And in fact, what we've seen when we were solving for the Stackelberg quantities is that the following firm's quantity of production is a function of the leading firm's initial choice, which means that leading firm actually has second order control over what the following firm is going to do. And conceivably, the leader might be able to take advantage of that. Well, we can answer this question by simply comparing what happens under Cournot to what happens under Stackelberg. And to make that a little bit easier, we're going to imagine that we have symmetric firms. When we have firm one's marginal cost equal to firm two's marginal cost, then the only thing that's going to differentiate them under Stackelberg is the order of moves. This will give us a clean comparison between the two. Well, under Cournot, we've already solved this. We know exactly what happens. With Cournot and symmetric firms, we have each quantity of production from each of the firms being A minus C divided by three. And then if you calculate the Cournot profits under that, each firm is receiving A minus C squared divided by nine. That's what's happening under Cournot. Under Stackelberg, we have to do a little bit of calculation. We already know that the leader's quantity is going to be A plus C2 divided by two minus C1. And the follower's quantity will be A divided by four minus three fourths C2 plus one half C1. Well, if we start off by making these firms symmetric, we can do a little bit of simplifying. So we have the leader's quantity of production A minus C divided by two and the followers as A minus C divided by four. And in fact, if we take a brief time out here, we might see where this is going. The leader's quantity here is A minus C divided by two. That is more than what happens under Cournot, where each firm is producing A minus C divided by three. So it's looking like firm one, that leading firm is having an advantage here. Meanwhile, that following firm as producing A minus C divided by four is producing less than it would under Cournot. So it looks like the follower has a disadvantage. Well, if we start calculating profits, we can actually get to that. So to calculate the leader's profit, we take the sum quantity of production and insert that into the price function. We then multiply it by the leader's quantity of production. And then we subtract out its marginal cost times its production, which is what gets us that very long string of numbers on your screen there. And if we do a little bit of simplifying, we get that down to actually something pretty straightforward. A minus C squared divided by eight. And indeed, we are seeing the leader doing better. Under Cournot, the profits for both of the players was A minus C squared divided by nine. Here, we are just dividing by eight. So that means the leader is doing better than it was under Cournot. We can do a similar, similar calculation for the follower, where we are taking the sum quantity of production, putting it into the price function, multiplying by the follower's quantity output, and then subtracting its marginal cost times its quantity, which is giving us that long string of numbers there. If we do a little bit of simplifying, we again get it to something relatively straightforward. A minus C squared divided by 16. 
So we are seeing a similar sort of result. We had the leader doing better, and as a consequence here, it appears that the follower is doing worse. Under Cournot, that second firm was receiving a profit of a minus c squared divided by 9. Here we are dividing by 16. So that follower firm is doing worse now under Stackelberg. Well, that's interesting. We've seen a nice result with symmetric firms. Does this sort of thing apply more generally? Well, in fact, it does. We have a theorem about this. For all marginal costs C1 and C2, in other words, if we're no longer just focused on the case where we have symmetric firms, but we're allowing them to be asymmetric so that C1 could be large and C2 could be small or vice versa, doesn't matter. For all marginal costs C1 and C2, a firm's profit is weakly greater as the Stackelberg leader than under Cornell. In other words, if I asked you as a firm, hey, would you rather play a Cournot game where you're choosing production quantities simultaneously, or would you rather play a Stackelberg game where I am making you the leader, then your response should be, you know what, Stackelberg sounds good to me. The proof for this is actually relatively straightforward. Think about it this way. If under Stackelberg competition, the leader wants to actually acquire Cournot profits. It can do that. And the way it does it is, as the leader, it chooses the quantity that it normally would under Cournot. So this is Stackelberg competition, but despite the fact that we are playing Stackelberg competition, we're playing sequentially, the leading firm basically treats this problem as though it were Cournot and produces its Cournot quantity. Well, we know what the follower is going to do. Because under Cournot competition, the follower is best responding to the leader's quantity of production. And under Cournot, we know that if the Cournot leader is producing the Cournot quantity, then that other firm, that following firm, is also going to be producing its Cournot quantity. Again, to recap that logic, if you are best responding, then under Cournot competition, if firm one is producing its Cournot quantity, then firm two's best response to that is to produce its Cournot quantity as well. So that means by virtue of choosing its Cournot quantity up front, the leader can induce the follower to also produce its Cournot quantity, which means that we have the Cournot quantities being produced in general, and thus we have the Cournot profits being accrued. So the leader is always capable of acquiring Cournot profits. It can never do any worse than that. But that means if the leader is preferring anything else, its profits must be greater than they are under Cournot quantities. So if it's choosing something else, and it's actively having a desire to choose something that is not that Cournot quantity, then that means it is acquiring more profit. What's happening here is, as the intuition of Prunt talked about, the leader is taking advantage of being able to credibly commit to higher quantities, which forces the follower to produce less and thus leaves greater profits for the leader. So here we have a general result that says that, that there's a first mover advantage under Stackelberg competition as compared to Cornell. That wraps up this lecture. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope to see you next time. Take care.